my name is James Thorne and I'm the manager of OCE Connections Program. And OCE's mandate is to foster economic sustainability and prosperity in this province. And our college and university students are the next generation of science and technology leaders in Ontario. And so any investment we can make in them is an, is an investment in our collective future. And any given year, OCE supports more than 3,500 students providing opportunities for them to gain real-world industry experience and sharpen their business skills and project management. You might be surprised to learn that this year almost 2,000 students participated in the Connections program. And that's the most we've ever had in the program. Connections is one of three OCE talent programs offered this past year. The first job program and value-added personnel program is, are the other two. For close to 20 years, I think next year is the 20th uh, anniversary of Connections, uh, Connections has paired final year college and university students with an industrial partner to address industry-inspired problems. The projects typically, range, uh, typically form an inter integral part of the students' final year studies. So I'm happy to report that Connections has been expanding, which means that, the more, that more and more students and industries are benefiting from the program. This year we had over 350 projects taking place at 27 institutions. Since February we've been conducting project reviews so that we can track the outcomes of the student work and identify the finalists for this competition. Sitting in the audience right now are members of the 15 finalist teams that have made it here to Discovery. So I had the pleasure of traveling to many of the colleges and universities that took part in this year's Connections program. And I must tell you how hard it was to select just 15 projects out of 356, actually. I'd also like to thank all of our students who filled out the connection survey. That's very, very important for us at the program. And we know from the results that 90% of our students from connections felt it was a positive experience. And 70% 70 70 felt that their outcomes would be used by their industrial partner. In fact, many of these students said that they anticipate being hired by the industry partners, and some said they were already hired. So I estimate somewhere around 170 students got jobs with industry partners because of their work on this Connections project. So, it's wild. And of course then, many others got, got uh, jobs with, because of their Connections experience with other industry partners. So the teams today will compete in three categories. We have the, the best connections project by a college team, best project by a university team, and best one by an OPA funded team. So we've selected five teams in each category and the winner of each category will win two thousand so dollars. In fame and fortune. So our judges will be scoring the presentations using five criteria that rate each each presentation evaluating evaluating the scientific and technical content, speaker clarity, good visuals, and how the teams tackled the, pro the problem proposed by their industry partner. The scores will be tallied immediately after the competition and the winners will be announced at lunch tomorrow. So I'd now like to briefly introduce you to our judges for today's competition. Uh, you, and you can find more bio biographical information on Discovery's website. So our judges are sitting over here. <laughs> Our first judge is, is Sue Abu Hakima, and she is co-founder and CEO of her second startup, Amica Mobile, which launched in 2007, focusing on emergency mass notification to any network on any device. Sue has been building innovation-based businesses for much of her career and has 20 patents and four more pending. Her companies have won 19 awards, the latest at the U.S. Security Summit uh, where one was judged the most innovative company of 2010 for emergency communication interoperabil interoperability. That's a hard word. <laughs> her achievements also led to her recently being awarded the Order of Ontario. We'd we're delighted to have you with us today, Sue. Our next judge is Claude Ha. He is President and Chief Executive Officer of the Ottawa Centre for Research and Innovation, or OCRI as it's called. Prior to OCRI, Claude was Managing Partner of Venture Coaches, a venture capital firm which he founded in 2000. Venture Coaches invested in 13 technology companies, with three having been sold, one merged with another company, and Dragon Wave, which is traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. 
Claude has been actively involved with more than 30 technology companies over the past two decades, from startup to acquisition and IPO. Welcome, Claude. Next on the judging panel is Corporate Director William McLean. William recently retired from IBM Canada after many years in a broad range of senior executive roles. In particular, his in-depth knowledge of operations and global strategy with respect to manufacturing and software development enabled a unique and competitive perspective internally and externally within the IT industry. On behalf of the IBM company, he was involved in many acquisitions across the product spectrum and was a member of IBM's Corporate Manufacturing Council. Thank you for taking time to join us today, William. Next is Jenny Mayellen. Jenny is the manager of the Technology Development and Conservation Funds at the Ontario Power Authority. The OPA is leading Ontario in the development of North America's most reliable, cost-effective, and sustainable electricity system. As a manager of funds, Jenny is responsible for developing a portfolio of projects designed to test the next generation of supply and demand side technologies, conservation programs, approaches, and policies. The objectives of these projects, the objective of these projects is to transform the market towards a culture of conservation to help Ontario reach its aggressive electricity targets. Thank you for joining us today, Jenny. Our final judge is Sarah Thorne. She is the president and partner at Thorne Butt Decision Partners Incorporated. Sarah regularly counsels senior leaders and teams in formulating behavioral decision strategies and communications to address complex topics. She is a regular contributor to the scientific and management literature on decision and behavior focused strategy and communications, especially the use of knowledge tools such as expert models and mental models research, and frequently speaks on the application of behavioral decision technology for strategy and communications design. She is a noted trainer in strategic risk communications, stakeholder outreach and dialogue, and dialogue based organizational leadership and change management. Welcome, Sarah, and thank you, judges, for taking part in this competition. So let's move on to the competition now. Each of our students will have five minutes to, pre to present their project to the judges. After, the, after they've presented, the judges will follow up with a few questions. So we have approximately two to three minutes worth of questions. Um, the five minutes is marked on this clock right here, which most of you have probably noticed, all the students who've been up to check out the podium. Five minutes, so you'll have your green light, yellow light, red light. You also have this device, which will signal the media guy, the AV guy, to change the slide or move to the next segment in your, in your presentation. So, we're going to see the finalists from the colleges first follow those by in the OPA category, and lastly, our university finalists. Our first presentation comes from George Brown College, so I'm going to hand it over to them now. So I'd like to ask the George Brown presenter, Laurel Dawson, to come up, and I'd like to say that um, if, the, if your team members wanna come up and stand or sit with you in the presentation, that's entirely fine with me. Um, so that's okay, and you may, you may need them during the question period, so they're able to speak during question period. So, now I'll call up George Brown College, the first presentation, portable wind-powered generator test bed. Laurel, good luck. Thank you, Jamie. Oh, I should, I should, I guess you'll mention that, never mind. Okay. Hi, everyone, good afternoon. My name is Laurel Dawson, and I'm with George Brown College. Um, my team members, unfortunately, are not here today, so please excuse them. My team members are Frank Chiapeta and Mark Caminiti, and our industry partner is John Camarda. He's with FOD3. So our industry partner expressed to us a problem. The problem was lack of availability of electricity for remote area workers. These workers tend to work in areas that are off-grid, so they would require some sort of power source to charge small electronics like cell phones, work lamps, etc. May I introduce to you the P3. It stands for a portable power pack, 
And what it is, is a nine foot wind turbine kit that consists of specifications as per the slide. Now we sat down with our industry partner and we hatched out a list of requirements in order for our project to be considered successful. These included the fact that it needed to be portable enough to fit into one bag, compact enough to be carried by a two-man crew. It also, most importantly, needed to generate enough power for charging the small electronics I mentioned earlier, and also needed to be set up with minimal tool use. Now, I'm happy to report in the initial stages, we did state that we would minimize tool use. Once we got to the prototyping stage, we were actually able to eliminate tool use altogether. So the user can set up our turbine with no tools whatsoever. I'm just going to highlight a few key features that we believe was innovative in our design. Our blades are actually foldable. This is in keeping with the portability aspect of our industry partner's request. It also has a tilting modular design. Now, modular in the sense that the user can actually customize the height of the tower based on the area conditions. Now, just to give you some background information on our industry partner, FOD3, they're a group of young professionals who work in the technology industry. They tend to work in areas that require that they need additional power that are off-grid, first of all and they do the type of work that would see them outside for extended periods of time. So in other words, our project was geared toward our company or our industry partner's company mandate. Now, in terms of our recipe for project success, my team and I came up with a little acronym that we used to describe how we best managed our project. The A stands for adaptable. Now, it's definitely imperative to have deadlines set out in the initial stages of your project. Um, we found, though, that one of the key factors that led to us completing this project successfully was the fact that we were adaptable. We were very fluid, and we continued to be so throughout the entire project. The R stands for the research aspect of it. It was important to know what our competitors had out in the market. In terms of budget constraints and time constraints, we also needed to research all the components that were needed. The second R stands for reliability factor. Now, the reliability factor, the old adage goes, if you want something done right, you've got to do it yourself. It actually goes out the window when you're dealing with a project. The reason being is you need to be able to rely on your team members, and that is exactly what our team did in terms of our reliability. Um, I found that we meshed pretty well together. In terms of our work, each of us had our own key strengths that we focused on. And where one person lacked, the rest of the team tended to make up for. The I stands for incorporate. Cri client relations were definitely important throughout the project. Um, Skype became our best friend because my team members and I tended to have late night sessions just to determine what our next, um, in terms of what our next day would encompass. Our main modes of communication between our industry partner and ourselves was working face to face and with via emails as well. The V stands for value. Now, not only did we have to ensure that the project costs were within the budget constraints, we had to minimize the overall costs of individual components with a thought always on the potential of commercialization. The E stands for enthusiasm. As we progressed in the project, it was ab absolutely imperative that we became or maintained our enthusiasm and we were excited to ensure that we arrived at a successful project completion. By mastering these six fundamentals, it allowed us to arrive at a successful project completion, like I said, in which we worked out a fully workable prototype. So our prototype is fully functional. In terms of some of another objective, as far as the potential for future development, our industry partner has future plans to work with future students as well as OCE to further develop the product and perhaps improve on some of what our shortcomings were. And in, as far as the economic potential, 
Um, wind power continues to be an incredibly clean, renewable source of energy and is forecast to become the most efficient power source of energy in the world in the next decade. Thank you very much to OCE, and a special thanks goes out to FOD3, our industry partner. Pardon? I beg your pardon? Cost for the product, cost. Did you uh, set objectives for cost? Yes. So would you like to, me to elaborate on how a budget? Um, our total budget that we requested from OCE was $2,000. No, I was, I was talking about product cost. Oh, cost per unit. We try to, in terms of value, the reason I have that under value is because we wanted to keep an eye on the potential for commercialization of the unit. We don't have a potential cost or a price point that I can give you right now, and the only reason is, in terms of our value, we wanted to try and keep down the cost should the unit be commercialized. So I don't, I can't, I apologize, I can't give you an actual value on terms of what it is, because right now it will not be commercialized, however future generations may be. For the prototype, including the electrical components and everything, because our tower is made of aluminum piping, it came up to a total of $2,000. I can hear you, yes. Explain what happens so that you don't have to assemble it. Our tower is made up of aluminum piping that is threaded, male to female connectors or couplings. So the, th the tower itself, basically you just need to thread it together. Our nacelle unit, which comprises your rotor, which is the blades. And if I could actually just have Dan click to the next slide, you'll get a picture of the skeletal model of our turbine minus the electrical components the nacelle and the blade unit comes pre-assembled. So the blades with the generator housing, the blades fold back and it actually comes in one bag. So you literally just screw it on. Everything is just threaded. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so the next team we will hear from is from Humber College. This is E Ankle Project, and Kazra Kane will be presenting. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our presentation. Today, I'll be presenting the E Ankle Re Research Project. This project was conducted by Humber Research in collaboration with Kintec Orthopedics and the Ontario Centers of Excellence. The members of my team include Anish Kumar, Harish Mangalakar, and myself, Kasroy Kane. I would like to tell you a story of a close relative of mine, Michelle. Michelle was born with what's known as clubfoot. Clubfoot affects one in every 1,000 live births. This hindered Michelle's development tremendously. She could not go outside and play with her friends. She could not even get herself out of bed in the morning. Um, Michelle was taken to the doctor and her ankle was fitted with an ankle foot orthotic or an AFO. Over time, this corrected her ankle problems and she went on to do some amazing things. Things that required strong and steady ankles. At age nine, Michelle was top of her gymnastics class. She was leading scorer on both her middle school and high school basketball team, and today she is an uh, aspiring professional dancer. None of this wouldn't have been possible if Michelle did not receive the ankle foot therapy that she needed. 
like Michelle, over 1.3 Canadian, Canadians suffer similar ankle foot disabilities. These may arise due to a birth defect, ankle trauma uh, resulting from a stroke. The problem with the standard AFO is that it's manufactured for walking on flat surfaces. It only allows the user's ankle to rotate in about 14 degrees, which is not enough for using stairs or even to go across uneven surfaces. What Kintec have done is that they've engineered the world's first automated multi-mode AFO. This allows users to walk on flat surfaces, use stairs, and or even drive. As you can see, this is another version of the e-ankle. Although the first generation e-ankle is an extraordinary product, it lacked the technology needed for it to be a product for the masses. The bulky wire that connected the ankle brace to the user interface was very uncomfortable and quite intimidating. The, pro the product also requires the, the user to have knowledge of the mechanics of the ankle brace in order to know how to use it properly. When Kintec decided to work on their second generation e-ankle, they approached us at Humber Research and they asked us if we can help them make the product user-friendly, intelligent, and improve the overall marketability of the product. We did so by first adding an onboard processor. This added intelligence to the system. It simplified the product tremendously from the user's point of view. It, it makes the product able to achieve a higher level of accuracy and it gives Kintec the flexibility to customize each e-ankle based on their customer's body type and posture. We also added a, a wireless um, user interface which got, got rid of the cables which made it more comfortable and give the users the ability to transition from different modes of walking going from flat surfaces to stairs and going from stairs to flat, to flat surfaces. The modular design of the, um, the system also allows the, the um, Kintec to port the controls from the remote controller onto other wireless enabled devices such as smartphones. So you can imagine someone wearing one of these in a busy city such as downtown Toronto during rush hour and they want to get on the streetcar. All they have to do is walk up to the streetcar they hit the button for stairs. And in a few seconds, they can start using stairs. They get to the top of the stairs, and they hit the button for flat surfaces. And in just a few seconds, they can start walking towards their seats. We've done extended research, and we have not found any similar product on the market or in development anywhere around the world. This gave Kintec, Kintec a very good an advantage in the industry. Kintec is planning on selling this product for $1,200 per pair, which compared to a standard flex joint carbon fiber AFO, which can go for as much as $10,000. As, as well as selling the, the product to patients, Kintec is also planning on selling kits to other orthopedists and AFO manufacturers around the world so that they can transform the existing AFO, standard AFOs into multi-mode automated AFOs. Kintec is planning on launching their clinical trials this coming September, and they're estimating, they, they, it is estimated that they would sell at least 30 units for clinical trials in Ontario alone. Thank you for your attention, and if there's any questions, you're free to ask. Twelve thousand, sorry. Yes. We're just ready to score it now. Okay. Thank you. Thank you also for the demonstration. 
So next we get to hear from uh, Lambton College. We'll be hearing from Jesse Bayens, and this is the Solar Race Car, Race Car Strategy and Marketing. Please welcome Lambton. Hello everyone, my name is Jesse Baines. To my left is Wilco Pluk, to my right is Luke Griffith, and we are the Solar Race Car Race Strategy and Marketing Group. Our goal was to search for sponsors as well as develop a race strategy for Lambton College's solar car project. Uh, this is just a brief outline of the presentation. So what is solar car racing? Well, what is a solar car? A solar car is any vehicle that uses sunlight as a fuel. Um, Lambton College will be participating in the American Solar Challenge race, which is over, over 2,000 kilometers long and takes seven days to complete. Um, they will be competing against other colleges as well as university teams from around the world. These are just some pictures of solar race cars that have already been developed by other teams. This is uh, some dimension restrictions on the solar car and the weight limit of, batter of the batteries that we're using. That's shown on the bottom of this slide. This is the race route. As you can see, it begins in Tulsa, Oklahoma. That's in the bottom left there. And it finishes in Chicago, Illinois in the top right. This is the solar race car project plan. We had uh, many different people working on this, so the labor was divided into multiple groups. Among them, the marketing and strategy, which was us. Then there was design, uh, chassis design, battery selection, among a few others. Um, teamwork and communication was essential for this project. With so many people working on the same project, we all had to know what was going on and keep up to, up to date. Uh, the main challenge facing solar car designers is using the limited power of the sun to power a vehicle. This graph here represents some of the power consumption rates of a solar car traveling at specific velocities. Uh, the bottom straight purple line represents uh, rolling resistance or friction, overcoming friction. Um, the dotted green line represents drag power and the top bold line there is the total. So put simply, we're trying to move a 300 kilogram mass from point A to point B using the power that could be supplied by a toaster oven. And we're trying to do it faster than everybody else. So what if no strategy is used? Well, because the power in the sun, or the power available from the sun and the energy stored in the car is so limited, energy management actually becomes the key to winning such a race. This is a solution my teammates and I propose to help the driver achieve his goal of winning this race. Um, in step one, uh, energy inputs, stored energy, and uh, energy output is monitored in the car, and it's transmitted wirelessly to the chase car. The chase car contains a computer. The computer will perform some calculations based on that information, as well as geographical information, and it will output uh, a display back to the driver, uh, telling the driver essentially how to drive, how fast he should go, and things like that. This is what that display might look like. Um, client relations, our group, with so many different groups, we met with other groups uh, regularly. We met with our professors on a weekly basis and our industry partners on a monthly basis in both formal and informal presentations. The industry partner goals were to have a rolling chassis by the end of April 2011. Um, students benefited significantly from this project. Among the benefits I've listed here, I want to draw close attention to working with the industry partners. Um, I personally had the benefit of working with a national, national instruments representative, and he and I discussed software and hardware that could be applied to the solution that I showed you earlier. Um, the des chassis design and fabrication group also worked with Fair Welding. Fair had a lot of valuable input towards the project and they learned a lot about that industry. Uh, so the project outcomes, we met our deadline, we have a rolling chassis, by the, we had a rolling chassis by the end of 2011, uh, April, and we also developed a strong foundation for our driving strategy. 
This is a picture of the rolling chassis that we have uh, fabricated. And some suggestions for future work. Driving strategy can be applied to any type of vehicle, uh, not just solar cars, to improve things such as fuel economy. So that's something to be looked into by uh, future groups. Also, Lambton College is still looking for sponsors, so uh, future groups will continue searching for them. Right, this has been the Solar Car Race Strategy and Marketing Group, and we'll take some questions now. Um, because of our funding and the fact that we're a college, finishing the race would prove that we've done a valuable job. Uh, for example, you wouldn't join a, a large racing industry and expect to win your first year, but um, finishing the race is our goal um, in upcoming 2014. Uh, does that answer your question? The average speed during the races can achieve, uh, I think one of the winners had 90 kilometers an hour or a little bit above that. The average speed is about 80 kilometers per hour. And does that map back to how many hours of sunlight? Like, or are you relying on a combination of solar and batteries? Um, it's a combination. Uh, the batteries, you'll have four kilowatt hours of electricity. To put that in perspective, You'll be able to drive at about 80 kilometers per hour for four hours with that, as well as you'll achieve, or you'll get about six kilowatt hours per day on a perfect ideal day. No clouds, no weather, no headwinds. So that'll be six hours more of 80 kilo, or kilometers per hour. That's, that's very good, thank you. Great. Hey, thank you very thank much. You very much. Next up is Algonquin College, and we have the project entitled ECR Steiner Tunnel. And uh, I hope, Andrew, I get your last name right. It's Andrew Wojcikowski. Is that good? That's good. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Good luck. Okay. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Steiner Tunnel. Uh, project. My name is Andrew Wojciechowski. This is my teammate Jean Paquette. Unfortunately, Jake Mitchell could not be with us today. Um, we are representing the mechanical engineering technologist of Algonquin College in Ottawa. So for the past year, we have been working in partnership with Elevator Cab Renovations, a company in Ottawa that retrofits the interiors of elevators in designing and building the Steiner Tunnel. Now, a Steiner tunnel is a machine that is used to comparatively test the flame spread and smoke generation of composite materials. So the Steiner tunnel was modeled from a pre-existing one-piece design, but to suit the needs of elevator cab renovations and the University of Waterloo Fire Research Lab. So our team designed and built a 30-foot long testing unit um, divided into six sections the intake, four mid-body, and the exhaust. And for ease of installation, we made them modular to allow quick elimination of sections prior to testing. Now this was a multidisciplinary project involving four parties, uh, the mechanical and the electrical engineering technologist of Algonquin College, the University of Waterloo Fire Research Lab, and elevator cab renovations. Now, in order to keep on schedule and maintain communication, our team used the Google Calendar feature to monitor project progression as well as academia. 
Now this account was accessible to each team member um, as well as their industrial partner. Uh, so in, in order that all parties involved uh, were to keep track of progress and to meet deadlines. So what we have here is a one week um, schedule where each uh, team member uh, sees how much work they have to do for the project as well on the bottom is their courses. Now, the standard tunnel will allow elevator cab renovations with the cooperation of the University of Waterloo Fire Research Lab to develop new materials in an effort to reduce production costs, uh, resulting in a safer, marketable material that adheres to all building codes. So now the Steiner Tunnel will resultantly impact all individuals within the following spheres where fire uh, safety is a top priority. So things such as the uh, elevator interiors, uh, hospitals, banks, uh, airplanes, trains, and even in your own home. So if the University of Waterloo Fire Research Lab can execute comparative tests with respect to the original one-piece design, while using this machine, the fire testing method throughout North America uh, may have to be rewritten since it has been changed in over 80 years. So we have our machine uh, on display just behind us in the manufacturing zone. So uh, you're more than welcome to stop by. We actually encourage you to stop by to take a look so we can fully understand how this machine works. And uh, if you have any questions, Jean Paquet here is more than welcome to answer them for you. Thank you. There's always a potential for that to, to happen. Uh, what makes our tunnel uh, exceed any other tunnel is it's more, you can break it down to sections, so it's more convenient for the end user. And what's a, a benefit is a cheaper cost, because one of these tests to perform, you gotta get, you gotta send it off to CSA, and that's a $20,000 investment. In this case, to perform a test, it would only be an $1,100 investment. So uh, the application to the industry is open to getting a commercial version of the Steiner Tunnel. Yeah, so we had to follow uh, an ASTM E84 type spec, and that sets out all the standards we had to follow. So we were given the dimensions of the tunnel and the chamber and the sample piece, and we had to design around that. So we had to just make sure that the materials we used were, could withstand the high temperatures. Uh, we weren't more in the study of focusing of, of the results that we're giving off of a sample test, but more the construction of the tunnel and having it modular. So that's more our primary focus. So. Yeah. We, we OC ha, give, uh, gave us a budget of $3,500. So we used uh, almost essentially all that budget. But what was nice is a lot of companies that uh, you can see over here uh, donated a lot of the materials. And we were able to, uh, I guess, be within our budget range. But if you were to build it out in industry, it would probably be uh, like a $20,000 uh, piece. So, any more questions? Okay. Any more questions? Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're on to the last finalist in the college category, and we're going to hear from Seneca College. And this project is entitled Remote Video Interface, and Wen Lee is going to be talking. Hello everyone, my name is Wen Li. I come from Seneca College. Today I will introduce you our project, 
Home Studio Video Communication System. This project is designed to improve the quality of video production process. Home Studio Video Communication System is a new technology that enables the creation of video content faster, 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 faster,
Yeah, actually, uh, if we further develop this project, I think the control, the switcher itself, it only cost uh, maybe below 500. Okay, thank you. Okay, I just want to say thank you to all the college teams for excellent presentations. We're going to move on to the OPA funded teams. So these, these teams are funded by the Ontario Power Authority's Energy Conservation Fund. And the fund supports projects that address electricity conservation and marketplace capacity for conservation programs in order to achieve significant energy savings here in Ontario. So the projects are diverse. Uh, but they all have a component that is uh, about energy conservation and hopefully they provide some solutions that help us here in Ontario save energy. So the first uh, group presenting is George Brown College and we're going to hear from the Integrated Energy and Home Automation Systems and Brian Lee uh, is going to make that presentation. Welcome Brian. Okay, hi. Good afternoon, uh, my name is Brian Lee. I'm also from George Brown College. I will do, be doing my presentation on integrated energy and home automation systems, which is funded by the Ontario Centers of Excellence and Ontario Power Authority. So our industry partners were the Courtright Center and TriVista Smart Homes. The problem with TriVista Smart Homes, their problem was they wanted, to, they wanted a demonstration site for their product line. The Courtright Center was an ideal spot. The Courtright Center's problem was they wanted a system which would integrate all of their subsystems in the house into one. We installed TriVista Smart Home Automation System at the Archetype Sustainable Energy Home at the Courtright Center. Our project goals were to connect the security alarm, control the lights and appliances within the house, stream media throughout all the houses, throughout the house on the TVs, monitor the HVAC system, monitor electricity usage, and have remote control over the system when you're away from the house. Here's a picture. We have all the subsystem, which includes the security alarm, the energy monitor dashboard, the lighting controls, HVAC, and the grid tie system. We ended up integrating all of these subcomponents into the main controller, which is the control four, uh, the top middle there. Here's the energy management dashboard. At the top there, top middle, we have the energy management dashboard, which is live over the web. You can view it on your phone, which ties into control four. At the bottom there, we have a heart transverter, which is something new. It's not in the market yet. Uh, there's a booth today over there that has a heart transverter. Uh, what it does is it takes solar wind inputs. It puts it into this heart transverter. It takes the energy, the raw energy, and it uh, charges your batteries, feeds it back into the grid, or it can power up your home. Alternatively, it can take the power from the batteries and power up your home, your lights, or feed it back into the grid. Uh, one smart feature, it can use uh, off on time and off peak times to charge your batteries. Uh, as well, it, can, it does a profile build of what you do. So you don't have to program it. It's an automatic kind of profile builder. It will look at it a month, uh, say that like you turn the lights at seven, you turn your TVs on at eight, your lights. It'll build a profile of all that and it'll compare the usage. And the unique thing about this product is that it can do demand response requests or load shedding. Um, an example of this is Hydro can install one of these units in your house along with a home automation system like Control 4. During the summer when the energy, uh, when everyone's AC unit is running and Hydro has a lot of electricity over usage, they would have to go out and buy electricity from neighboring cities. Uh, what they can do is if Hydro has one of these in each house, they can send a signal along the power lines. And the hard transverter will understand that signal and it will dim the lights if it can dim it, uh, turn off lights, and also turn off your heating or cooling if there's no one in the house. Uh, we work closely with TriVista to build a demonstration site, which is running right now for their smart home technologies. They're very helpful in providing tech support throughout this installation. 
The Courtright Center ha now has a system that will integrate many of the subsystems in the house. George Brown students, faculty learn new technologies and now have opportunities for more research projects along the energy management in the near future. The team uh, who worked on this system together, they were split up into groups, which was divided into his or her own area of specialty, uh, whether programming, electronics, control, and commissioning. In the end, we all came together and integrated it all into one user-friendly interface. The next steps are to this project are to start a new project using the hard transverter, make the Courtright Center a demonstration site to test on-demand responses from utilities, expand on adding subsystems into the house, which includes solar panels and battery storage systems, and explore other new home automation technologies, which an example is uh, Google Android Home, which is a new one out there. And now I would like to thank OPA, OCE, Toronto Regional Conservation Area, TriVista Smart Homes, the students and faculty at George Brown College. And this concludes today's presentation. Which one, for energy? Yes. Uh, yeah, we have a live energy dashboard, which we put in last year. Uh, it basically it measures the current on the meters, and it's a live feed. It tells you your kilowatts. You can go back a couple months, it data logs everything. Uh, the data log comes in seconds, minutes, hours, months, and it builds a profile for you. Also, it can be linked up to your Google Home webpage. So when you go to Google, uh, it's called iGoogle. It can be interfaced into that uh, webpage. Yes, uh, Control 4 does that. So when you open the door, uh, we have light sensors everywhere now. So it detects the light level outside. So when you open your door and the light level, say, our set point is 40, and the light level outside is 80, and we open the door and it, it detects that it's bright outside, so your lights won't come on. So say like it's thunderstorm outside and it, the light level is 12. So you walk in, of course you want your lights to come on, right? So when you walk in the door, the lights will come on. And they'll go off after 30 minutes, unless you override them so to save energy. Have you had an opportunity, or are you planning to test this with people to see how user friendly it is and if it's sending them the kind of signals that would cause them to reduce their electricity use? Uh, right now it's not out there yet, it's coming. Just uh, Courtright, they installed it a month ago and we're just using a demonstration. We just integrate it, it sends, uh, basically what it does, the heart monitors the levels coming into the house and your load usage. If it drops below, I believe, uh, 110 volts, then it'll, a relay will close and it'll send a signal to control four, which we have programmed when it receives a signal, dim your lights, dim your loads, turn off HVAC if you can. Uh, as a consumer, the cost it will probably be about, the base unit is about 2000 and the electricity you save with the system will pay back for itself. So once the system's installed, you got it all configured, when do you want your electricity to be used, your peak time, your on times, then you'll be saving a lot. Uh, oh, basically you just switch up a light switch. So you just switch out your light switch and do some program. It's all wireless, so it's just plug and go. Okay, thank you. Now I can be a witness, it does work. They, they did it remotely from George Brown and then the guy from the court right had to text message and say, would you please turn the lights back on? <laughs> okay, next we're gonna hear from uh, Queen's University. This team is, uh, the project was called Energy Recovery and we're gonna hear from Anne Bereen, uh, Jan Farouk, Queen's University. Hi, 
I'm Ambrine Farouk, I'm from Queen's University, and today I'm going to tell you how we saved $30,000 for our industry partner, Covidian. Covidian is a multinational pharmaceutical company, and the facility which we worked with is located in Montreal. We had a great working relationship with our client team there. They were always prompt in giving us responses to our questions. One such example is we contacted them, it was because we needed answers for, to finish our designs for the day. And one of our main contacts said, give me a call. It turns out he was at home sick. He just wanted us to have the information right away so we could get going and we could finish the designs as soon as possible. So I'm just going to tell you the foundation for the project came from the initiative of the Montreal facility to become a greener plant. They wanted us to do an energy recovery project where they had two WFI distillation columns that were sending heated water to drain. They wanted us to create a design that would capture the energy that was being lost in the systems and use it to heat up an inlet city water stream that entered their reverse osmosis or RO facility. So this is just a simplified diagram of exactly what our design had to do. We had the hot water going to drain. We also had the cold water going into the RO system. There needed to be a trans oh. yeah. There needed to be a transfer of heat so the inlet city water stream entered the RO system at a temperature of 25 degrees. Our design would replace what they currently use, which was a natural gas heat exchanger. So this quote really applies to us as a team. Just the takeaway at the end, project management is a trained engine that moves the organization forward. We relied heavily on the Gantt chart and the work breakdown structure that we created at the beginning to guide us through to the outcome of the project, and it helped us to focus and stay on task. But first, we had to come together as a team. We each had our own idea of exactly what the outcome of the project should entail. So we had to sit down and collaborate to come up with a unified set of goals to present to the <laughs> to present to the team, which included a payback period of two to three years and good cost savings for our design. We also established a network of connections through the project, people we could seek advice from as well as have them double check our work before we forward them on to our client. So once we had set up our goals, we could move into the process of the design proposal. We came up with five initial ideas for energy recovery, for which we made various schematics, as well as we contacted several vendors to get budgetary quotes for each design. We presented all five to Covidian, and they selected the one they liked the most, and we moved into the final design proposal. This we elaborated on the initial idea. But it took an interesting twist because we made so many revisions. We connected with the client via conference calls as well as with meetings with our advisors till we came to our final design, which we made several schematics again, which include this PNID as well as a 3D model to get a visualization of where everything would go in the plant. Once we had completed this, we sent in it as the final design package to Covidian. And what they did is they sent it in to be approved for budget, which it was, and right now they're in the process of installing our design within their facility. And what they get out of it is a $30,000 a year savings for the plant, in a, and the design has a 1.2 year payback period. So a little risk management saves a lot of fan cleaning. There were tons of risks within the project, but the major one we had to focus on was making sure we had inherently safe designs. And we used the experienced eyes of the people within our network to manage that factor. We also faced a number of challenges and obstacles throughout the project. The greatest one was into the design period, the information about the streams got changed, so we had to backtrack and start all over with our calculations and budgetary quotes. We hadn't accounted for this in our Gantt chart, so that was a lesson we learned there is to allow for a little bit of wiggle room whenever you make your deadlines. We also had to do a lot of balance and time management. We only had five to six weeks to move from the proposal to the final design, so it was a huge crunch time. So what we did is to make sure all our meetings and our agendas had a point and purpose, that we didn't do anything that wouldn't get us a deliverable at the end for the client. And that takes us into the lessons we learned. The major one was design is iterative. It'll go through so many changes depending on how many people see your design. You'll get so much advice that you really need to decide what is valuable for the client. And as I mentioned, don't have meetings when you don't need them. They're really pointless and you get nothing done. 
and applying our design to the bigger picture, if we could get one stream rerouted to save $30,000, imagine if in industry all plants use their wasted heated water. So I'd just like to thank the OPA as well as the OCE, as well as our supporters through the project. Yes. And we will now entertain some questions. Yes. Um, it's currently being installed. They've ordered the valves, and they cost quite a bit of money, but they've ordered them. There was a big lead, t lead time for them, so it takes about eight weeks to get those, and they're starting on the piping as we speak. So, so the $30,000 takes into consideration in capital investments and everything, that, uh, and it's a complete business case. Is that right? Uh, pretty much with our payback period of one year. So the first year, your savings will cover all the equipment and piping you'll have to purchase. And after the first year, they'll begin to see this $30,000 a year savings. And that's with the current utility prices. So as utility prices rise, these savings will only increase. Obviously, your client has seen some really good value because they're going ahead and implementing it. Um, I'm wondering about your perhaps broader market research, what other kind of plants could this solution apply to um, and with the you know, cost breakdowns, et cetera, be, be similar? Um, it would really depend on the plant because this project was very specific in terms of we had to look exactly at what their current situation was and how we could come up with a way to save money on this. So in terms of other plants, you'd really have to take like a really detailed, close look and see where you're wasting energy and where you could possibly use that energy to make any savings. So it really depends on the plant how much savings you could get other places. And through your evaluation of this uh, plant, did you perhaps identify some other energy savings uh, opportunities or which weren't necessarily related to uh, this solution? Um, one that we sort of ran into that we weren't expecting was saving on water costs. We initially just thought it was just going to be heat recovery, but we actually eliminated an inlet water stream, which saved a ton of money on top of the heat costs. So that's another area that they can implement throughout the rest of their plant, is looking for water cost savings. Okay, the next team is also from Queen's University. We've got three entries from Queen's in this category. They did an excellent job. So we're gonna hear from the Ener Energy Integration Assessment Team, and this is Matthew Dermody is going to be presenting for Queen's. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today I want to talk to you about an amazing opportunity that was presented to us through OCE's Connections program at Queen's University, working for Greenfield Ethanol. My name is Matthew Dermody, and these are my teammates, Kale Vandemel and Eric Lang. And together, our multidisciplinary team was able to develop a solution for Greenfield Ethanol's Johnstown plants that has the possibility to increase its yearly revenue up to $6.6 .6 million remove the four and a half megawatt plant from the grid, all with a payback period of two and a half years. Now you may be wondering, how did we do this? Well, first off, who is Greenfield Ethanol? They're the largest producer of ethanol in Canada, making over 450 million liters each year. And over 50% of this is produced at the Johnstown plant. However, they are experiencing a problem. They currently have frequent power interruptions from the grid causing downtime. And just last year, it cost them over $200,000 in lost revenue. So they came to us and tasked us with the job of finding a solution to this power problem. Through extensive research, um, contact with the OPA and Hydro One, we came up with several solutions, some of them being a large battery backup, a large flywheel, and a natural gas turbine. In collaboration with our client, we determined that the natural gas turbine would be the best solution for the plant they would be able to generate their own reliable electricity. However, we had a major problem with this solution. Our natural gas turbine would generate electricity, but as a massive byproduct, 
there would be a lot of waste heat. And we had a request from a client to keep the solution in parallel with their green initiatives. So that meant finding something to do with this waste heat. We eventually decided upon installing another additional animal feed dryer at the plant. This would allow the plant to increase their production up to 12%, um, their overall production up to 12%. So now our solution was generating electricity and increasing their capacity. We proposed this to our client, they gave us the go ahead, and we developed the detailed schematics of how to integrate the turbine uh, with the dryer. We also came up with three options of how to integrate the uh, electricity uh, at the plant. The first option was to do, remove the plant completely from the grid by powering it with the turbine. The second option was to generate excess electricity and to sell it to the grid through OPA's feed and tariff program, or FIT. The third option was to sell all the electricity to the grid and to buy back what we needed from the, uh, from the grid as well. We did an economic analysis on all three options and determined that the third option would give us two and a half million dollars more per year in increased revenue than the second best option. We took the two best options and did a net present of value and determined that our payback period would be approximately two and a half years for option three. Now as a consulting company would, we prepared a final report highly recommending that option three be implemented at the plant. Collaborating with our clients, the duration of this project um, included site visits, conference calls, and extensive email contact. This working relationship we established with them was extremely beneficial for both us and our clients. On the other side of the scale, we had the pleasant experience of dealing with industry vendors. As I'm sure most of you know, that they don't really want to deal with student groups. However, we persisted through all our rejections and eventually found several companies that were willing to work with us. Through the process of this project, we also learned many valuable skills, planning and project management. We learned that having a good Gantt chart will not only keep you on track and organized, it is essential to every project. This is a copy of our first Gantt chart we made. It is not, I don't expect you to read it. With some help from our supervisor, we um, managed to develop our skill and create a useful tool that helped us keep us on track and meet all our deliverables. We also learned that communication on a standardized and united front will not only relieve your stress, but increase your productivity. And one of the most important lessons we learned was asking the right question. It is a combination of experience, intuition, and logic. And hopefully after four years of undergrad, we had enough logic, but we definitely lacked experience and intuition. And through this connections program, we developed our initial experience and some intuition, which make us great candidates for any company looking to hire us. And none of this would have been possible without the generous support of the OPA, the OCE, Greenfield, and all those at Queen's University. I'd like to thank you all for all your generous support that you've given us. I'll now field any questions. Um, we, in our discussions with them, they initially wanted us to put it in like a, a greenhouse or somehow to deal with this excess heat that would be making. But um, we looked at trying to implement it somewhere else in, the pro in their processes, but it's already highly uh, energy efficient. So there wasn't much room for play on that. Um, there's there's a great opportunity here. It all depends on the on the company and the industry, um, but basically you need to be able to integrate that heat. There you can you can incorporate a cogen unit, which is our solution, into a number of different uh, industries as long as it can in, in, uh, integrate that heat. 
So if they can integrate the heat, then they can be part of the FIT program and they can make that ex excess money. But if they can't integrate that heat, then they don't fall under the FIT program and therefore they don't get that solution. Um, it's we there is no real way of assessing that number so we don't have it it just it basically falls down to whether or not they can integrate that heat and it's a very site-by-site -site analysis it's very specific to each individual company so we don't have those numbers So, you're, like, if we could make like an assessment company out of this, um, I think it might be possible. Uh, it it have to be willing along the companies. This company had that issue with the power problem, so it'd be up to the company if they're willing to get into the speed and tariff program. Our next project is energy auditing with Rio Cannon Ottawa Hydro. Cody Whitaker is going to be uh, presenting for Algonquin College. Hello, everyone. My name is Cody Whitaker. Our team performed an energy audit of Lincoln Field Shopping Center. It's a two-story building with a total of 44 stores. Currently, there are eight vacancies. It's located in Ottawa and owned by a company called RioCan. One of our main goals was to help the shopping center save money. So in order to do this, we needed to look at ways to reduce power consumption. By reducing power consumption, their leasing rates would become more competitive, and as a result, uh, sorry, they'd have less vacancies. So we did this by looking in two different directions. One with heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, and the next one with lighting. So this graph illustrates the importance of having the most energy efficient HVAC unit. The green correlates the power consumption to the monthly average temperature. So why is efficiency so important? The red is what it used to cost Lincoln Fields Shopping Center to operate one HVAC unit a year. With our research, we were able to help Lincoln Field Shopping Center save $4,600 for every HVAC unit they install. So through our research, Mike Graves from Baxtech uh, now has, or is now implementing new HVAC units throughout Lincoln Field Shopping Center. The, the shopping center is currently upgrading their old inefficient lighting with new fluorescent bulbs. They'll save 20% a year. Uh, through our research, we are able to show senior level management at Lincoln Field Shopping Center the extra cost it takes to operate these old HVAC units. So now that they'll be using energy more efficiently, so now that they'll be using energy more efficiently, they will be saving money and as a result other companies will want to learn how. So Richard Thorne, our industrial partner, asked us to communicate regularly with him. So we did this by interacting regularly and by keeping him up to date. We met Mike Graves through our industrial partner as a third party member. We were responsible for communicating with him to confirm our HVAC results. So one of the biggest problems we had was trying to arrange meetings with, uh, with senior level management 
at Lincoln Field Shopping Center. Through Perseverance, we were able to have two meetings all year. Another one of the problems that we had was that the HVAC units were over 40 years old. Now that's old, but through our meetings and through our research, we were able to help Baxtech get a contract to begin replacing these old inefficient units. So in order to successfully manage our team, we would have weekly meetings with our professor, David Thibodeau, and during these meetings, we would discuss our accomplishments, our next steps, and any problems that occurred. We would also have weekly meetings among ourselves to group our ideas together, uh, to divide the work up evenly, and in order to organize ourselves, we would use log books to keep track of all the minutes. So by interacting with senior level management at Lincoln Field Shopping Center, it has given me great experience in communication. As well, I have learned to work well as part of a team to achieve great goals. The real life experiences I got out of this project were to be organized, to prepare formal reports, and to manage a team fairly, which I feel it will be greatly beneficial later in the future. I am now better educated to use energy more efficiently to use energy more efficiently, and I will be able to pass this knowledge on to my future employers, friends, and family. I would like a job in the renewable energy sector. However, I have, uh, sorry. <laughs> However, working with any company that strives for efficiency would be great. I would like to take this opportunity to thank OPA for funding our project and wel welcoming us here to present today. I'd also like to thank OCE for providing us with a connections project and Rio Can for taking the time to meet with us, as well as Hydro, Ottawa, and Baxtech for putting the time and effort in to help us with our project. And we can't forget about our professor, David Thibodeau, who has guided us along the way. Thank you. Originally, we started, uh, we were going to do an energy audit of Westgate Shopping Center and Lincoln Fields, but because there was so much work involved, we were only able to do one of these. And that's just two shopping centers out of the five that are in Ottawa. So across uh, Canada, there will be many, uh, or many participants that would like an energy audit. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about the audit process. What did you actually do to identify the HVAC and the lighting opportunities? So basically, uh, with the lack of time we had, we didn't actually physically do an energy audit itself. What we did, we looked at the aspects of the thing, because your two main components, no matter even residential or anything, your biggest power consumption is your HVAC units, which is your heat and ventilation, and also your lighting. It's stuff you use every day. So we we're using the Bastec company, we looked at the numbers with their old HVAC units on the roof, and personally, we couldn't even find the stuff on the internet and everything, because it's such an old company that they actually have to go in their files and look it up and help us through it. So what we did, we did it by numbers and everything, with the light and everything, we took, like, calculated the values, the most efficient light in, the prices, and seen how much your payback period would be. So with the light in itself, you're obviously gonna have to change the ballast, what makes light bulbs work. So it takes you both 4.5 years to do that, but then you have the middleman in between to pay and everything, same as the HVAC units. So we looked at that aspect, but not actually physically doing it with our hands. Does that answer your question? Okay. Great guys. Perfect, thank, thank you. you. So we move on to our last finalists in the OPA funded teams. So we're going to hear from Jason Wong. This is Electric Vehicles Smart Charging Infrastructure from Queen's University again.
Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jason Wong, and I'm here representing Queen's University and PowerStream. I'm here with my teammates Jeff Leslie, Jeff English, and Adam Kubaki. I'd like to start with a story about little Susie and her lemonade stand. Little Susie knows that during the hottest days of the year, she has to have enough lemonade to serve everybody. And usually her pitcher's big enough to serve all of her neighbors and have a little bit left over. But recently, a new family moved in and they drink twice as much lemonade as anybody else. So little Susie's pitcher isn't big enough. And so what does she have to do? She has to buy a new pitcher or she has to tell everybody that she doesn't have enough lemonade for them. This is essentially the problem that faces local electricity distribution companies when plug-in electric vehicles, or PEVs, come onto the market later this year. Our client, PowerStream, is a local distribution company that serves 300,000 customers across Ontario. These customers will be purchasing plug-in electric vehicles because of the reduced greenhouse gas emissions and fuel costs. Unfortunately, charging a PEV requires a huge amount of electricity, which strains the already taxed distribution network. This problem is most important at the pad mount transformer level, which is the last stage in electricity distribution before the residential home. This graphic here shows how much of a, capacity, how much of a transformer is being used at peak hours. And if you'll notice, there is a pretty good safety margin. If you add one PEV to that mix, that safety margin pretty much disappears. And if you add two, then the transformer goes over capacity. Think about that for a second. Two cars per transformer. That's your car and your neighbor's car. So that's the problem that we're trying to solve. Because if PowerStream has to replace every single one of their transformers in their service area, it will cost them $83 million. So an $83 million electrical engineering project being solved by a chemical engineer, two mechanical engineers, and an engineering physicist. That sounds odd, but I think that's exactly how it works in industry. You work with a bunch of different people from different backgrounds, and you tackle a problem that is completely outside of your comfort zone using your engineering skills. And I think that's what we did. Now, in addition to the technical details behind power distribution, we realized that there were social, financial, and legal aspects to the topic. In order to work and learn more efficiently, we, we decided to assign each team member to be an expert in each of those fields. That way, each member could learn and research that individual topic and summarize his work to the rest of the team. That would help us reduce our workload individually, but still made sure that every person knew what was going on in the project. We had a lot of communication with PowerStream to make sure that our ideas aligned with their vision. We had an initial brainstorming session where we came up with a list of about 25 potential solutions to their problem. And in collaboration with them, we were able to narrow that idea that list down to three ideas. And in order to actually evaluate the best idea, we created a model that would simulate the effect of PEVs on a sample neighborhood. Now the sample neighborhood was created using data from PowerStream's newly, newly acquired smart meter data system, which tracks household consumption on an hourly basis. The, green, the blue line there shows the neighborhood consumption on average uh, over the course of a day, and you'll see that even at maximum times, it doesn't go over the red line, which is the transformer capacity limit. Now, if we add the PEV load on top of that, you'll see that between four and seven o'clock in the evening, uh, there, is a potential, there is a potential for the transformer's capacity to be exceeded and for the transformer to fail. But if you take a look, there's a lot of open space between uh, midnight and six o'clock in the morning that that cars could charge. And when we were developing the model, we realized that this was the best option. If we could push charging onto nighttime, it would allow PowerStream to use up their capacity, their nighttime capacity without straining the system during the day. And this would be beneficial to customers because it costs them less to charge at night and it, and it would be beneficial to PowerStream because they wouldn't have to pay too much in upgrading their costs. In the end, we believe that our outcome our project helped PowerStream overcome a major barrier to widespread PEV adoption. Personally, we learned a lot of skills such as client communication, uh, team management, and the ability to stay flexible, especially since our client contact changed halfway throughout the project. We were able to prevent a usable model for PowerStream and a business strategy that saved them $60 million. 
And perhaps most importantly, we allowed little Susie continue running her lemonade stand without forcing her mother to shell out $80 million. Thank you very much for your time. We'd like to thank, for, we'd like to thank the OPA and the OCE for uh, supporting the project, to PowerStream for being our contact, and for Queen's University for being uh, very helpful in uh, running the project. <laughs> so, uh, I'm sorry about that. I, I'm just saying, uh, did you try to make contact at all with uh, anybody uh, in the industry itself, like the, in the car industry, in the vehicle industry, like a mag, uh, who I know for a fact are spending a phenomenal amount of money here uh, in this particular area? So, I, I know you work for PowerStream, but I'm just wondering if you, you went to the other side and you actually so talked to somebody, somebody who's trying to do something within the car itself. Well, uh, we had to do a lot of predicting of consumer behavior. There are a few, can you hear me? Hello? <laughs> Sorry. We had to do a lot of predictions of consumer behavior and there are a number of people worried about this problem. So we looked at a lot of people's reports, like we talked to a Quanta, Manitoba Hydro, and a company in California called Better Place, who's already partnering with PowerStream to get some of our data. identified a strategy for PowerStream. I'm wondering if you were able to take it the next step and uh, perhaps find some uh, actual technological solutions that they could actually implement to achieve this. Yeah. So essentially, most of the technological solutions that we came up with were um, based on the research that we, that we did. So we weren't able to go ahead and implement them at all. But right now, PowerStream is testing the chargers. They have two uh, Nissan Leafs and they have a charger so they're doing some technological testing on that. But some of the solutions that we researched um, involve monitoring the power on a transformer. So a power monitor would be on the transformer and connect to the houses that that transformer powers. And it would communicate with the chargers within them, those homes to ensure that two electric vehicles don't charge at the same time so the capacity is never reached. Um, additionally, this is this a strategy that we propose, but I'm not sure if it's clear at this point. Um, we use time chargers within the, the chargers to move those um, loads to the nighttime. And those uh, chargers can be scheduled by a power stream or by the owner to, to alter that time accordingly. I think definitely this solution would apply to any electricity distributor in Ontario because electric vehicles won't just be in PowerStream's region. And uh, the information, we're, it's not specific to PowerStream, especially with our model. The inputs can be changed um, so that it can be performed for different areas and different geographic locations with different PEV scenarios. Um, to, I don't know if I can expand on that. Um, so if we were... If we wanted to make a consulting company to ourselves, we could possibly take our report and keep it private and take our mo model, continue to develop it and keep it private and offer those services to companies around. But um, essentially what PowerStream is going to go forward with in uh, purchasing and controlling the charging, I think that could be held by a private company. But we have a lot of work to, to get to that point. So.
absolutely. Okay, we're moving on to the final category, but I'd like to just thank all the OPA teams for presenting. We've got plenty of space so all those standing out there can come and sit down over here. So we move on to the university teams. So we're going to see uh, James K present improved glass lens design for McMaster University. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is James Kay, and this is uh, Karan Tejpal. We're here from McMaster University representing Christie Digital Solutions. I'm here to talk to you about the Illumination Optical System, uh, better known as IOS. Uh, the IOS is present in each one of Christie's projectors. They're a cinema projector company. Uh, inside of the IOS, there are five uh, lenses. Uh, with those lenses, we're experiencing problems in two of them, uh, the L2 and the L3 lenses. Uh, in the L2 lens, uh, when Christie has one client that operates these uh, projectors at 110% power, and under these conditions, uh, for one client, there's a 6% failure rate observed. Um, so our objective in this project was to actually determine a service temperature for the L2 lens. Another problem we had was uh, the L3 lens is a lead-based component. It doesn't actually crack under the current conditions, but with lead uh, legislation in 2014 coming due, uh, removing lead in all electronic applications, uh, this is something that's going to need to be replaced. So we're looking into new material recommendations for both the aperture and the iOS, as well as the, the glass material itself. Uh, so some of our problems uh, in terms of this project, uh, we had uh, difficulties in actually gaining access to the lenses. Uh, they're packed in tight to a projector that's uh, difficult to reach. Uh, we were able, however, to uh, maintain two different uh, methods of determining this, and through that uh, we were able to compare the data and figure out that the lenses were cracking on the cooling down portion of our, uh, of our projector problem. Uh, so looking into some of the causes of failure, we had a xenon arc lamp. Uh, with this lamp, it gave uh, the picture that you can see on the slide there. That's a ray tracing diagram. And so we had concentrations of heat that were building up. And with these concentrations of heat, we had a number of internal stresses and strains that were causing the uh, lenses to crack. Uh, so the main reason for these heat uh, concentrations is an aperture. It's located about a millimeter above the uh, L2 lens plane. And uh, the steel aperture that was initially in place uh, was, uh, still has a poor thermal conductivity. And because of that, it wasn't dissipating the heat evenly or uniformly over the lens face. Uh, this was causing a number of these heat buildups. Um, so, as you can see from our data here, uh, the steel, which is the blue line, uh, gave us much more or much higher temperature readings, as, long, as well as a, a much more steeper slope. Uh, this is uh, a lot of that has to do with uh, with thermal shock. Uh, so, um, uh, as you can see with our, our red line, that's the aluminum aperture, the material that we we uh, looked at replacing it with, and this gives us a much lower uh, temperature as well as a much uh, smoother. Um, uh, much smoother uh, curve. So, uh, could I get the next slide, please? Uh, next slide. Uh, so, thermal expansion and thermal shock was what I was mentioning. Uh, the thermal shock, the steeper the drop in temperature, uh, the more likely it is to actually break. And we can do this by decreasing our temperature gradients as well as uh, doing an external, uh, decreasing the thermal expansion coefficient. Uh, so our recommendations, obviously, in fixing this program was to switch to an aluminum aperture. Uh, this uh, spreads out the heat much better and, uh, and seems to fix the problem. Uh, recommended solutions. The other thing we did was we looked into uh, shot glass. They provided all of the glass for uh, Christie. Uh, we looked at uh, list oil glass, and it has a much lower thermal expansion ratio or factor uh, than the MBK7 or the SF4, which are the current materials uh, that are used in the, uh, in the uh, projector. In terms of our group dynamics, uh, we made seven trips to the company. We performed all of our experiments there. Uh, we had great communication with uh, chief scientist there, Terry Schmidt, and we split up the group evenly, uh, group work evenly. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, in terms of our conclusions, uh, this is an industry that's just ever expanding and projectors in this industry are just going to keep on getting more high powered and ramp up uh, even more. Uh, List oil glass hasn't actually been implemented yet, but it's an alternative that we're looking at in case uh, higher projectors are built. Uh, the aluminum aperture has been uh, already uh, uh, inserted into the projectors and we're confident in our results because the client that we had uh, all of their uh, failure rates has basically gone to zero with just the aluminum aperture being placed into uh, into the machine uh, so that's uh, the 37 lumens is is the current output this will be exceeded in the near future uh, and if it's not uh, and the list oil glass doesn't fix the problem as higher projector uh, higher power projectors are pr produced uh, we'd want to look into a potential uh, barrel redesign of the unit uh, any questions unfortunately one of our group members uh, couldn't actually be here today yeah, he had a work uh, assignment at the last minute <laughs> oh, don't. <laughs> My usual cost question. So what's, what's this going to cost you? Uh, what's the market like? Um, eventually, what would it cost per unit? What's so, the potential? Sure. Uh, the total cost of the project was $600. So it didn't actually cost us that much to do our testing. Uh, in terms of the cost for the company, uh, we weren't actually given any of those. A lot of it, this was uh, kind of high top end secret stuff that we couldn't, that the company didn't want us to disclose. Um, but what we were told is that um, with even the 6% failure rate, uh, the cost of insuring the client uh, to go back and fix the problem manually uh, was great enough that whatever we did in terms of replacing a lens or whatever experimental we, uh, procedures we needed to do, it would be much less than what they were actually incurring in terms of having to go back and, and either, you know, give them a whole new unit or, uh, you know, um, replacing it. Each unit pretty much sells around a hundred grand. So that's, that's why we're talking big bucks uh, in terms of what we were doing was insignificant. Given everything that you've learned, is there a commercial opportunity here to sell this technology through the whole industry? Uh, most of this, uh, most of the problems in this industry are all very uh, industry specific and are already under patent. Uh, this was mainly our, our problem was an industry related problem that uh, related to one specific, uh, one specific machine. Uh, it's a very niche market. A lot of it's to do with the actual the 3D um, projectors that are used in uh, some of the, the cinemas that you'll see. Uh, so it's that technology there that's, that's being related. Um, and uh, the, the cracking of these lenses was due to the high powered nature. So uh, only in Christie's units are they able to get up to that power level that causes their specific lenses to crack. So it, it's not really something that you could take and run with. I might have missed it, but did you get a chance to try the new aperture? Sorry? Did you get a chance yes, to Yes, uh, we implemented the aluminum aperture, and that's actually what solved the problem. So okay. we put the aluminum aperture, and the uh, client that Christy has that uses this uh, basically took their failure rate from 6%, although even I thought when I got this problem that seemed small. Uh, you know, it took it down to zero, so we're not having problems. We mentioned the lift soil glass as an alternative if we go even higher in the future with production. Thank you very much. Okay, the next team we're going to hear from is from the University of Guelph. Um, we're going to hear from Michael Lantine, uh, talk to you about some dairy products that they've developed. All right, good afternoon. My name is Mike Lantine. These are my colleagues, Eric and in Good afternoon. My name is Mike Lantine. These are my colleagues, Eric Martin and Anita Ryback. The three of us comprise Aim Healthy Foods. Um, we were tasked with creating a lower sodium, lower sodium dairy products this path for the past 12 months. Um, today we're going to be discussing with you in detail one of those products, which is a zero sodium added sugar reduced chocolate milk. So do we need a healthier chocolate milk? 
The American Heart Association recommends that no more than 8% of an individual's caloric intake should be derived from sugar. One gram of sugar is equivalent to four calories. For the average caloric intake for a nine to 13 year old is just over 1,700 calories, which equates to 34 grams of sugar. As a result, in this 250 milliliter carton of chocolate milk is 76% of a nine year old's daily intake value of sugar, equivalent to just over 140% of their value in a 500 milliliter carton of chocolate milk. Some of the health concerns um, with respect to sodi over -sodi excessive sodium and sugar consumption um, are both heart disease and stroke, which are two of the three leading causes of death in Canadians. Um, it is estimated that nine, nine in 10 Canadians will be affected by this at one point in their lifetime. 73% um, of our parental respondents stated that they do aim to reduce total sodium um, consumption by their child on a regular basis and 98% of respondents stated that they do try to limit uh, total sugar content consumed by their child on a regular basis. Our primary target market for this, cho this chocolate milk product is children. There's just over 5.7 million children um, that we're targeting in Canada, which we will be targeting primarily through elementary school milk programs. We do recognize that parents do display household buying power, and as a result, the parents, 15.6 million adults, will be targeted um, with this product as well. With respect to the, over, <coughs> the overall Canadian milk market, it has seen a decline in the past five years. Um, both volume and value are expected to forecast through till 2015. With respect to our product development process, we were tasked, as I stated, with reducing sodium in dairy products. We brought to industry four very viable um, products that could, in fact, benefit from sodium reduction, at which point they stated that the most feasible and viable products to move forward with would be that of a chocolate milk as well as a lower sodium semi-hard cheddar cheese. So at that point, we spent the past six months in the food science buildings um, creating and perfecting our product recipe um, to meet the demands of our target audience. We were able to establish um, a significant amount of business relationships throughout the past 12 months. The University of Guelph faculty was instrumental to our success. We're we were able to meet with the Dairy, farmer, the dairy Farmers of Ontario um, marketing manager responsible for overseeing all of the elementary school milk programs. We were also able to meet with superintendents from the Waterloo Regional District School Boards to identify with them how we would go about taking our product to market and the direction that nutritional products are headed um, in elementary schools throughout Ontario. Uh, other companies that were instrumental to our success was, were Jersey Ontario, Ontario Centre for Ex Excellence, OMAFRA, as well as AgriFood and Rural Link. With respect to some of our research findings, 84% of students in elementary schools actually stay at school for lunch. Of that 84%, 35% participate in school milk programs. And of the students participating in the milk programs, the current average per capita consumption is only three and one quarter cartons per month. Now milk products, chocolate milk products are made available to these children 20 days of a month. And therefore there's a 16 and three quarter carton per capita shortfall on a monthly basis, which this product aims to fulfill. With respect to sensory testing, we were able to um, conduct sensory testing on just over 700 respondents at the University of Guelph, where no material difference between a control sample, um, which contained full sodium and sugar content, was found when compared to both of our healthier alternatives. With respect to some of the survey research that we, that we conducted, parents are looking for a healthier chocolate milk product. There's no doubt about that and they were actually willing to pay up to a 20 cent increase per 250 milliliter carton provided to their child. Moving forward, we are looking to secure our intellectual property with trade secret protection. We are currently working with the Business Development Office at the University of Guelph um, on disclosure agreements, and at the completion of those, we will look to take this product to market um, with the attempt of licensing this product formulation to one of the three um, primary milk manufacturers and distributors throughout Ontario. So that, in a nutshell, is our healthier chocolate milk. If there are any questions or concerns, we would love to address those. My question is, how soon would the uh, product be ready to be commercial? I don't know if you saw, but just last week in the United States, uh, several states were already talking about getting chocolate milk in schools, and parents are hysterical. Yeah, a lot of, um, that's actually how we start. We started off with just looking at a sodium reduction, and at which point the DFO stated, look at sodium too, or look at sugar too, because we almost lost sugar in elementary schools. Um, we have a product formulation completely um, solidified. 
it's ready to go to market. And in terms of distribution, it's more of a, it's more a matter of distribution. Um, we recognize that it is more feasible to license it out to a pre-existing distributor. Three milk manufacturers control the entire dairy industry. Um, and as a result, going through one of them in a licensing arrangement would be most feasible. But it's ready to go now. Pardon? What's the delay? What's the, delay? <laughs> the delay is we're just in the process of signing our disclosure agreements and then getting into contact with... To the product to market? If, if we wanted to take the product to market tomorrow, we could take the product to market tomorrow. Yes. Um, so I would assume that they want things to move faster. Yes, I would assume so too. And if it could happen this week, I, <laughs> I would like nothing more. You didn't bring samples for us. Right? No, we didn't. We just brought the unhealthy milk. Thank you. Sue, I want to say that uh, I did try the chocolate milk. And it was excellent. Yeah, it was great. Okay, we're going to move on to the, the uh, next finalist from McMaster University. Uh, we're going to hear from Mohammed Faridah Salam talking about the Dynamo power supply. Hello everyone, uh, my name is uh, Ferdo Salam and I am here on behalf of uh, our group uh, Hussein Al Hilal and two other members who couldn't uh, make it today. Uh, we are here to talk about our uh, Dynamo power supply project uh, that we built for WS Tyler uh, as a final year project at McMaster University. So W.S. Tyler is the pioneer behind the design and manufacture of uh, vibrating screeners. Uh, these vibrating screeners are used to separate rocks and aggregates, uh, uh, rocks and aggregates uh, uh, with the help of uh, various uh, screening media. Uh, it is uh, very important to continuously monitor these uh, screeners uh, for to prevent the damage at an earlier stage and to optimize their production rate. So for the continuous monitoring of these machines, the company decided to uh, employ sensors that uh, could uh, remotely monitor the performance of these, sen uh, of these uh, screeners. The main focus of our project was to power these sensors. Uh, and the challenging part here was the environmental condition in which, in which these uh, screeners operate. So as most of these uh, machines operate outdoors, they are subjected to harsh environmental conditions like uh, rain, dust, and uh, falling rocks. And wired connections here are not preferred as uh, they might be hazardous for the workers and the operators uh, and wires usually tend to fail in such an environment. So as you can see, this is the project constraint provided to us by our industrial partner, WS Tyler. Uh, the sensor here requires an input voltage of 3.3 DC volts. And most of the machines manufactured by W.S. Tyler have a frequency range of 10 to 20 hertz and an amplitude ranging from 10 millimeters to 2 millimeters. Uh, and as uh, preferred by our company, they wanted the cost of our design system to be as low as possible. And while uh, designing our process, uh, the frequency and amplitude provided here were quite uh, quite wide and they needed to be narrowed down. Thus, uh, with regular meetings with our company, they were able to provide us with uh, detailed specifications of the different types of machines that W.S. Tyler builds uh, based on their priorities in the market. So 
in order to power the sensors, we decided to use the vibra vibrating energy of the screeners themselves. Uh, this will thus solve the issue of running wires across uh, the vibrating screeners and uh, thus eliminate any source of external power like uh, batteries as uh, they have limited lifespan. Uh, for our, um, our design basically used the basic principle of a mass spring damper system. Uh, So uh, as an initial step, uh, we assumed uh, the natural frequency of our uh, system in accordance with the machines built by W.S. Tyler. And uh, with this assumption and with the provided constraint, we were able to figure out some of the basic parameters like the mass, stiffness, and damping of the system. So for the mass, we used a magnetic mass that will generate uh, power by using the theory, theory of uh, electromagnetic induction. For the modeling of the stiffness, uh, springs are generally used. But due to the provided mechanical constraints, we replace this, these springs with opposing magnets, which will help increase the lifespan and durability of our system. For the process of damping, we con uh, we minimize damping by controlling the airflow across our system. So these were some of the technical parameters that we took for our system. Thus, in conclusion, uh, with the help of uh, our group members, the advice of our uh, academic professors, and with the cooperation of uh, our industrial partner, W.S. Tyler, we were able to meet the power requirements of the sensors. Uh, our design will successfully serve 90% of uh, W.S. Tyler machineries uh, used by industries today. And uh, this provides W.S. Tyler and its company with uh, significant cost-saving measures and thus guarantee the company uh, c increased customer satisfaction and sale. Thank you. Just kind of wonder what what your client's going to do with this. Uh, it, it sounds like you say significant cost savings, but um, uh, is, has, has the company given you any indication what they're going to do with your prototype or your idea at all? Uh, uh, the sensors will be employed on the machines to detect the problems at earlier stages. So instead of the machine breaking down and the production line will be stopped the problem will be detected at an earlier stage and it can be fixed at off operation hours, saving the company and the customer amount of money. Okay, next in the university category, we have Ontario University Institute of Technology. We're going to hear active aerodynamics, and Gregory Walker is going to be telling you about that. All right. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. We're honored to be here today. My name is Greg, and I will be presenting the Active Aero Wing for Road Vehicles on behalf of my group members, Chris, Carl, and our school, UOIT. Various driving conditions consist of high speeds and sharp corners, and all car manufacturers incorporate aerodynamics because it plays such an important role in vehicle stability, fuel economy, and performance. And I've seen in the figures body roll reduces stability, which can lead to dangerous situations. So therefore, the root of our problem is based on increasing vehicle stability and high-speed cornering and braking, which will result in higher levels of safety. The solution to our problem is to design universal aerodynamic elements that will be able to aid in the improvement of vehicle stability, 
uh, while becoming a preventative safety measure. And we wanted to make these elements react on and adjust on their own. In other words, be active, which is accomplished using proprietary electronics. And by making it active and split, we're able, we are able to manipulate the downforce and drag forces, which is how we can improve stability. So we pitched our idea to various companies seeking industry support. Now, Eric Latino, an active member in the racing community uh, and president of Global Emissions Systems Incorporated, was impressed with our idea and agreed to sponsor the project. And ASECO, a control systems engineering firm that has a lot of experience in the automotive field, also agreed to support the project. Using Eric's experience, he was able to provide a lot of insight with respect to racing standards, as well as material suppliers. And he demonstrated an interest in adapting our technology for his own personal racing applications. Uh, so designing the aero wing was very challenging as it involved a wide variety of engineering disciplines. Beginning with the aerodynamic shape, we used CFD software in conjunction with CAD to design and optimize the physical wing. And then FEA stress analysis was used to uh, test the rigidity of our design. And then the electronic controller, which combined a sensory input, a microprocessor, and an actuating system, had to be uh, designed, programmed, and calibrated for our application. And the end result was an easy to use product that met our initial goal while being in a competitive price range. So the value of a comprehensive project schedule was demonstrated by meeting all of our milestones within our eight month time frame. We assign specific roles based among group member specialties, uh, while including our sponsors and mentor throughout the entire design process. Our goal was to design this product to be marketable while remaining cost effective. And this goal was successfully met with our full scale working prototype, which would only require minor alterations to become market ready. And uh, after putting our work up on YouTube and various car forums, we've observed a large interest for this technology, including inquiries for sale. And we would like to invite you to come by the UIT booth later to view our prototype. So we now have a short video of it actually working on the car. Um, as you can see going around a corner, the inner wing is inclined, uh, which uh, increases downforce. And this is how we improve stability. And similarly, under braking, both wings incli uh, incline for maximum downforce uh, to improve braking performance. So we wish to impact uh, the use of aerodynamics in the automotive industry by introducing this active control. Our control system technology understands a vehicle's state, which then can manipulate a wide variety of uh, aerodynamic elements, uh, which then, then impact fuel economy, uh, performance, and safety. And we are exploring the option of starting our own company, and we are looking into applicable patents as we feel this has a wide variety of applications. So we learned a lot from this project, including the importance of uh, strong project management, communication, and teamwork, which was definitely a necessity. Uh, each member trusted each other, uh, which allowed us to work together very efficiently as we all valued each other's contributions. And we all gained a great deal of confidence working with real practical design considerations. And as new graduates, these are skills we will use throughout our careers and we can take with us into the workforce. So we would like to thank our sponsors, uh, Global Mission Systems Incorporated, ASECO, OC, and UOI, UOIT for all of their support, as well as our sponsor, Dr. Or sorry, supervisor, Dr. Yu Ping He. Uh, thank you for listening. We will now accept questions. <laughs> So our budget for this project was $3,600. $2,000 of that went towards our actual working prototype. Um, other costs went towards uh, like project planning, uh, like reports, um, and we also had another part of the project uh, making a splitter, which uh, we decided not to bring. Um, so to actually implement this, we feel we could reduce that cost even more to even around $1,200 for the actual uh, manufactured wing. 
Um, because like we said, there would be minor alterations to the design. But you're going to have to install that wing on the car, right? So you're yeah. going to have to find like either body yeah. shop people or somebody yeah. to install the wing on the car. So. Yeah. Actually, also, also to add on, uh, this wing does not, won't be applicable. It won't be the same wing for each application. It will be different aerodynamic element designs. So the cost will vary depending on what type of application you want to put it towards. Like this, this was strictly a racing car, racing act activity. But we, we, we plan on going highway safety. We plan on going even passenger car. We may not use this shape, this size, this design. But the technology behind it is what we want to apply towards. $1,200 apply to a racing car wing, not yeah. a stand, like yeah. standard car would probably go cheaper. Yeah, it would, yeah, it would yeah. probably minimize costs. Yeah. Uh, well, the whole idea here, like we said, was that the uh, the control system itself is what's applicable to other industries as well. Um, so anything, typically anything that moves through the air, uh, this is something that we can that can be applied to, uh, whether it's something automotive, uh, something even uh, say um, with airplanes, uh, just whatever. Like I said, anything that moves through the air, you just creatively find an application for it uh, to increase safety or to increase performance. So it's very uh, very flexible. Yes, fuel economy uh, was a concern as well. So like we said, it's active. Um, so the main advantage to that is you can change the angle, which changes the uh, amount of drag. So for our prototype, we were able to calculate that we reduced drag from 58 newtons to 43 newtons. So a 15 newtons uh, amount of drag, uh, which will uh, less resistance for your car, so you're using uh, less fuel. And so it increases uh, fuel economy in that sense as well. Sorry, just to add to that as well. Um, also, the wing can produce downforce uh, to increase vehicle stability through cornering and braking, uh, but to increase uh, fuel economy as well. Uh, part of the uh, problem with vehicles is the rolling resistance of the tires and the wheels, and that's what robs a lot of uh, sort of gas consumption from your vehicle too. Uh, so actually, with these, with these uh, aerodynamic elements, by changing the shape, um, you can also produce an amount of lift uh, we're in situations where you don't need uh, downforce and that extra stability. Uh, that will decrease the rolling resistance of the tires, and that would also increase uh, um, sort of fuel mileage and decrease consumption. We haven't yet come to any car companies with our idea yet. We want to go through patent search, trademarking, and all that before we try pitching the idea, just in case, just in case we find that this could be something we want to hold on to rather than let it go. Because we have mentioned we are looking into starting our own company, which could, if we do, if we do succeed in that, we can branch off to car companies and brand. Exactly. Yeah, we can sell it to the car companies itself through our own company. So that's kind of the five-year steps we've got going right now. Okay, now we move on to the last university team to present today. We're going to hear from Lakehead University. Tony Sinclair will be presenting about the electric bus system integration. Um, in, in 2006, in the United States alone, buses consumed over 1.1 billion gallons of fuel. Now just imagine the carbon footprint of 1.1 billion gallons. In case there's any confusion, my name's Tony Sinclair, and that's Nicole Negerbond, and we've been working on the electric bus management system, which is an ongoing project which hopes to address this issue. Now, we know that electric buses are not an original idea. We know that 
they already exist, but our system doesn't. Basically what we want our system to be is an adapter between an electric engine and the rest of the bus. So let's say you have a diesel bus and you want to install an electric engine in it because you find it too loud or you want to reduce on fuel consumption. You would install an electric engine along with the EBMS and the transition from diesel bus to electric bus would be completely transparent to the driver but not to the environment. The project was developed mainly in C-sharp and, con and consists of two main parts. The first being the user interface, which resembles a very simple car dashboard. The second part was the programmable microcontroller. Now a microcontroller, you could think of it as a self-contained, very small, very basic computer on a chip, which we use to interact with the electrical portion of the project. And we take this, these two parts and package them together and we installed it on a golf cart. <clears throat> so the bottom line requirement of this project was to install the previously existing EBMS onto a golf cart. When we began working with la the previous work, we noticed that it was extremely bloated, it was extremely confusing, and it lacked a lot of functionality. And to make matters worse, the student in charge of the electrical portion of the project decided to drop out of school with only one month left. Um, we managed to build momentum and we eventually did accomplish the specified requirement, but we didn't just stop there. And to be frank, I don't think we'd be here today if we did just stop there. We managed to severely simplify the code while not losing the functionality of the main system. There was no sacrifice between simplicity and functionality, yet the system is considerably smaller than it used to be. Now overcoming these roadblocks wasn't particularly easy, and we did so by holding regular meetings with our advisor and ourselves. We drew up a software project management plan, which is essentially a document that outlines things like your deadlines, your responsibilities, your goals, and your plans on how to achieve those goals. When we weren't in meetings, we monitored our progress using collaboration tools. <clears throat> Excuse me. We monitored our project using collaboration tools, which allowed us to keep logs of our updates and provided everyone on the team with a universal copy to work from. Now our client was Jeff Irwin of Electrodynamics Inc. It's a startup company in Thunder Bay. Now Jeff is an extremely passionate man. He truly, truly wants to see this project come through. He provided us with a golf cart, with blueprints, manuals, advice, mentoring, everything we needed. Jeff was always there to lend a hand. We had regular meetings with Jeff to update him on the progress and the direction we were taking the, the project. And likewise, he would update us on the conferences and trade shows that he was attending in hopes that it would benefit the project. It was a, an absolute pleasure to have Jeff on the team because he was so interested in the project and you could tell that he really cared about where it was going. So Jeff acquired the golf cart through a local country club and they are considering installing our system on some of their golf carts which would be a great benefit to the project because we'd be able to test the system's durability and also possibly expose any bugs that we may have missed in the system. But in my opinion, and I think Nicole can agree with me on this, the most noteworthy achievement is the fact that we have developed a simple, easy to extend project for future students with clear and thorough documentation. Now making the transition from golf cart to larger vehicle will be a lot simpler with our product. The, the requirements did not specify that we had to make this an easier project to use for future students, but in my opinion, this is possibly the most important achievement of this project. 1.1 billion gallons of fuel. Public transportation does get the job done, but we do not have to settle. The EBMS could be the change we didn't even realize we needed. Thank you. I think that you have captured the scope of the 
opportunity. How far away is this from being something that you could sell to a major transportation company that has buses? Well, the plan for next year is to actually move up to a larger vehicle, like say a truck. Um, and then the next, the next logical step then would be the full bus. Um, that would all obviously be up to next year's team and whatnot, but I have faith that the project in a couple years could be com complete and could be on the market. Have you tried to connect with a major bus user, a major city or label or somebody like that that would use a lot of buses that might want to you know, help you leapfrog your technology a little bit? Well, right now our client actually has a fleet of buses, so we're going to start there before, well, with this, this project just included a golf cart, but I'm assuming that they will start with the client before they branch out to major bus lines like TTC. Okay, so that brings us to the end of the presentations. And uh, I want to say that I was very impressed with the quality of the presentations and the finalists this year. Uh, not only have they undertaken some really great work on their projects, but they presented it to us in interesting and innovative ways. And thank you to all the teams for the work you put into your presentations and for everybody for joining us here in Toronto today. Uh, this competition has been videotaped and you'll be able to get those presentations on the Discovery website later. I'd now like to uh, extend a special thanks to our judges. Thank you very much, uh, Sue, Claude, William, Jenny, and Sarah, for taking time out of your busy schedules uh, to lend your expertise, ask ex excellent questions to our competitors today. In recognition of this, I'd like to present you with a small token of appreciation now. <laughs> Geraldine. Uh, So one more thing too is I'd like to encourage you all to take a look at the finalists for our student video competition. We have three competitions at Discovery. We have this connections competition, we have a video competition and an oral competition. The oral competition is tomorrow, but the video competition you can see on screens, I think I saw them over there, they're sort of peppered around. You can also go on the Discovery site uh, to view those. Um, the opening recession or reception is about to start. I think we're, we're finishing a little bit early, so you have a few minutes to walk around and, and check things out, but the reception is starting. And I will be holding a connections information session. So anybody out, even abroad from the, the, the audience here, if you're interested in learning more about this program, um, I'll be here at 6 o'clock to tell you a little bit more about it. And uh, we we'll, may have some of the professors and advisors and industry partners for the program to provide some extra information. So please spread the word, and I hope to see everybody at 6. So I would like to thank everybody for coming to the Connections competition today. And I'd like one more round of applause for all the finalists. Thank you very much. Excellent job. Thank you.